Hi everyone, um, my name is Dogo Taskan. I'm the CEO of Stamball Studios. Um, we are um, virtual reality and augmented reality, homebrewed here in Vancouver. I've been living here for the last 13 years, originally from Turkey. Um, I started my, uh, basically this company started as a visualization studio, uh, getting real estate developers and construction companies, uh, showcase their projects in the most futuristic light possible getting people to replace uh, the need to build a presentation center uh, and all the physical assets that, that come with it, for example. Uh, but then we started uh, diving into a couple different areas, which I will be talking about uh, in a minute. As for myself, I've worked at Electronic Arts uh, and Ubisoft as a lead gameplay programmer, um, which is basically driving all the cars and pedestrians around the city that we were building open world environments where we were simulating an entire uh, game doing the same things uh, that would be applicable for a smart city simulation as well. And I later moved on to Microsoft to build their core graphics for a new operating system that they were developing at the time. Um, today I'm going to be talking about digital twins and um, talking about the points where it led me to talk uh, to actually uh, about digital twins again today. But what it is, is uh, that this is a chart from Gartner that is talking about the top 10 strategic trends. Every year they come up with the new trends, but in the last three years they came up with the concept of digital twin and they put it over there. Uh, we're gonna be talking about that uh, in a little bit, but I'm probably gonna be touching base on all these things, augmented analytics, um, basically uh, immersive experiences, empowered edge, uh, as well as smart spaces. As They all correlate to one another. They're all interconnected. You cannot just uh, separate. They're not isolated technologies, individuals. Let me describe what a digital twin is first before I dive uh, a little bit deeper into what it can do for us. Um, it's basically a digital, a virtual replica of a physical asset, a process, um, or people or cities, systems, anything that is related with it. It, uh, it is encompassing both the elements and the dynamics of that physical twin that we have. So um, Dr. Michael Greaves introduced the concept in 2003, uh, 2003 at University of Michigan on a course of, uh, for product life, sorry, product life cycle management. And he defined that there's actually three main prerequisites for something to have a digital twin. It has to be, it has to have a physical product in real space, a virtual product in virtual space, and the connections of data and uh, information to tie them together. How do we actually achieve that is basically uh, through the sensors. Like it's not just a 3D geometric or mechanical representation of the physical asset. It's also the electronic representation uh, or the characteristics of or the behavior of that physical asset that is reflected into the uh, digital equivalent of that. Uh, so we install a lot of sensors and like hundreds of thousands of sensors could be installed into an infrastructure project or a, a building project. And all of that uh, data is sent to cloud and then later analyzed for further um, outcomes that can potentially create um, new ways to look at the physical asset, like ur urban logic does to uh, the cities or the infrastructure that uh, the city makes available. So the data flow is essentially uh, from the physical twin or the physical version of the, uh, the asset to the digital twin, there's usually the uh, operational data that goes in, uh, as well as the context data and, and the asset data, but then otherwise, uh, from dig the digital twin to the physical twin, we again send the operational data, uh, a local model, and a, a control. You can control things with that digital component of it as well. And uh, what do we use the digital twin for? It's basically a lot of things, but if, uh, at, at its core, it can extend the life of asset and an equipment. Uh, you can extend the life of a building through predictive maintenance with this. You can uh, uncover a lot of inefficiencies with the, uh, with the operations if you look at, uh, if you simulate this uh, data with like further artificial intelligence components and machine learning, you can uh, uncover these inefficiencies and provide additional insight into how you can improve them. 
you can, uh, I mentioned the predictive maintenance component, but uh, by preventing, sorry, by doing predictive maintenance, you can reduce your operational cost eventually and enable better uh, response to your uh, episodes of downtown, uh, downtime in, in these uh, physical assets. And obviously you can, it's not just um, that the building sensors or the asset sensors that are feeding the, the twin, there could be external data sources that are coming into the digital twin, which then allows you to, to be more aware of your situation. For example, a digital twin of a stadium can, talk, uh, can get the data from uh, the events calendar or any surrounding traffic-related data to improve uh, the decision-making process during those events uh, from um, the city, uh, by the city authorities as well. Um, so I'm gonna quickly touch on uh, how we're going to actually achieve the um, digital twins in the construction industry. As last night I was the, at the meet and greet event and somebody said that construction industry just one level is just one level above the agriculture when it comes to digital technology adoption. So, uh, as you know, in, uh, like construction 4.0 is referring to the industry 4.0, where everything is basically built entirely virtually before uh, it is it is taken to the physical world, and uh, all of the things are simulated. Everything is interconnected with one another. Um, how are we going to do that in the in the uh, construction industry? It's basically uh, like, you know, digital twins are just one level beyond BIM. It's just like an avant-garde version of BIM that is uh, interconnected with all the data sources, not just something related with the construction, but also all the operational uh, stuff as well. Um, so this is how BIM works. You just like stay in the concept and the design phases uh, and move into uh, construction and then a little bit of operations with the BIM data currently. You can have 3D, you can have documents, anything that is created in the BIM programs and stuff that you, you're using, but also all the external assets coming into it. What Digital Twin is actually, through the structured interoperable data, it takes it beyond that. Um, you, just, you just add machine learning, predictive analytics, um, and you can ask other things, like what if analytics is there too? You can change things in real time, you can move things around and see how the, the physical asset is going to behave if you make that decision, make that change. Um, what I don't like about this particular chart is that it's a linear graph, because it's not like showing us a cycle. It's more like this. This is how it is going to do uh, its work and its benefit, because BIM is only useful for the first couple of years, where uh, the concept starts, you design, you construct, and you hand off, but then the, it's end of life for BIM at that moment, generally. That's the case. We want to extend it to the entire lifespan of the building, or even the entire lifespan of the city. And the only way to do that is going through, starting by the design, um, you move to construction, you, take, you use BIM um, as your, you're leveraging BIM as your database in a way, your single source of truth through the common data environment. And apply it for maintenance, you go back and redesign things, you're going to use the digital twin. So it's a continuous thing that you're going to be building from the get-go. Um, you know, you have BIM, you got 3D BIM, you also have the sequencing, uh, 4D BIM, you got cost, 5D, you got environment, it's 6D BIM, or vice versa, you can add asset information and life cycle management that becomes 7D. So it moves on like this, and it's called BIM XD now, as every new component is added to it. Um, I actually, like, I'm probably gonna be coining a term today, but what I call as like infinity dimensions BIM, or BIMfinity, I call it, is X-dimensional BIM plus industrial IoT plus artificial intelligence machine learning plus AR, VR, plus 5G, and it's gonna go on and on and on with this. So basically, um, there's so many components to it. How are you gonna achieve it? That's what, what I'm gonna be touching base on. That's why I said Gartner's predictions are gonna be enabling us um, with a whole bunch of things, and, and I'm gonna be talking for every one of them. So with every building, there's gonna be, or city, 
there's going to be hundreds of thousands of sensors. And all of these sensors will collect real-time data, real-world data, push it to the cloud. We're going to need connectivity infrastructure for that. What's going to happen is edge computing will actually take over. You can't connect all these devices directly to the cloud for privacy reasons, for a whole bunch of other governance reasons, but you're going to be connecting them to a local server. And then synchronizing all these devices with the real state of, of the digital twin. But then you're going to be start pushing that data into the cloud from that uh, edge computing device um, by using 5G elements. You're going to need a lot more bandwidth than what it is right now for, that, um, for, for us to achieve the real digital twin. That's a lot of data being pushed into the cloud. Uh, we're not, we're not going to need only the infrastructure to push it, but also to analyze that data. And that is basically what artificial intelligence, big data, and machine learning will enable us with. Um, the interesting part here is it's not just analytics. It's not that we're showing you the numbers. Urban Logic just did a great job of showing what it is going to look like. Augmented analytics is about you asking super simple questions to that data. You can't, you don't want to know every aspect of your physical twin. You don't want to know whether every door is open or closed at any state. You just want to ask questions to something and receive answers from it. You can just say, when do I need to change my water heater? That's all you need to know. Nothing else matters. You can ask this question, and that's what augmented analytics through natural language processing and um, artificial intelligence is going to be doing. You're going to say, hey, Alexa, turn off the lights in my daughter's room. The device doesn't know who you are. The device doesn't know who your daughter is. The device doesn't know where the room is located and what control system it needs to control to achieve what you desire. But then, with augmented analytics, all these things coming together, it's not an isolated system. It's going to be able to do that, control the thing, or also receive uh, and extract information from all these hundreds of thousands of sensors that I've just mentioned. It's going to be pushed to the cloud through edge computing. So that simplifies things. I don't want to look at Excel tables to extract some really interesting information. I just want to ask it, or I want it, uh, the machines to be doing that job for me. What What's going to happen is we're going to have all these conversational interfaces. As human beings, we're, it's not natural for us to go to work at 9 a.m. and sit in front of a rectangular screen up until like 6 p.m. or in most cases 10 p.m. Um, for like a long stretch of time like that. It's more natural for us to deal with the physical world around us as it is. You can't look at a screen and try to understand a 3D um, world. It's just a projection of that world. You want to understand it in, in three dimensions, and that's what uh, AR and VR are enabling us with. If your facility managers are going to the site and trying to just look, at, look up something on BIM format files and trying to extract information from that, it's just a waste of time. You can just go to that place, look at that HVAC system, or look at this wall, uh, that ceiling, and see what the deficiencies are, what all the data that is coming from those devices are on the spot, then you can make the decision on the spot as well, instead of hunting for that data. What, um, and this is an important thing, like this is something that you can't just uh, skip over, it is because if we're gonna get everyone to speak BIM, we're gonna need the buy-in at ev every level. That's, that's what your trades are gonna need to speak, that's what the architects, the engineers, the city level executives, everyone will need to speak this language for us to be successful in a digital twinning approach. Um, so AR and VR are enabling these people to interact with this data because it is natural. It's not just like looking at a two dimensional screen anymore. It is in space, it's on a tabletop and you're operating on the data as it should be in three dimensions. So this is the, the progression we have. Right now, we're designing everything. The UX challenges are here. We're just targeting uh, different segments and the conversational interfaces. Um, it's very targeted. It's persona focused. What we are looking to do with IIoT, edge computing, AR and VR, uh, artificial intelligence, is we're trying to turn your whole environment, ambient environment, into a computer. We're, as a tech industry, 
uh, we're trying to get rid of all these displays that we, we keep looking at. They're detached from us. They're not natural. We're just literally carrying them uh, with us everywhere. It's not natural for us to carry a laptop. It's more natural for us to go there and experience it over there all intuitively. And that's what the ambient, like Alexa, uh, AR, VR, uh, combined with AI and machine learning are going to enable us with. So coming to a smart city perspective, more like there's several applications that have been developed over the years in the name of smart cities. But the interesting thing is everyone is seeing smart city as their own entity. They just, they build one um, mechanism to track the assets, like the fleet management stuff is also saying they're actually building smart cities. Smart cities are not a bunch of individual applications like that. It's more like it needs to be a digital twin of the city, an entire city fed with data from multiple sources, and it needs buy-in from the private sector, public sector, um, government, um, and uh, it needs uh, data governance, it needs privacy regulations, all these things, and again, it, it has to be at every level. Um, you know, there's a few applications that are being developed around the world. Um, there's a few cities that are getting their virtual replicas of the entire city. Singapore, Rennes, London, Dubai, they're among them. And when you have this digital replica in 3D of the city, you can make a lot better decisions. Uh, using something on Google Maps is not a digital twin. But being able to tie every element of a building, every element of a development process for infrastructure as well as uh, public and private buildings is what's going to enable us with the true decision-making tools for transportation, um, healthcare, and everything else surrounding those. This is a, an image from Virtual Singapore. Everything you're looking at here, it's all interconnected. And this data came from BIM. This started by everyone delivering their BIM data at the, during the handoff process, handover process, sorry, to the city, so that a BIM light version of every building could be integrated into the digital twin. You can do sun, sunlight simulation with this. You can run simulations for transportation. You can add new roads and see how the traffic is going to be affected. You, and it is all 3D. It's not just a two-dimensional graph. You can build a bridge and or multiple levels of multiple layers of uh, transportation mechanisms to see that here. You can click on any one of these buildings and see where their, uh, sorry, see the uh, pressure levels on each one of the fire hydrants that the building has. That's, the city looks at this and uh, basically the data coming from the garbage, uh, uh, garbage bins. They measure the weight of the garbage bin and see how, it, how full it is so they can actually send all the garbage trucks to that direction as well. So it's used for operations at that level. And it, it can be done all through artificial intelligence as well. So the decision making could be done to send those trucks over there to pick up garbage around the stadium because there was an event that day, could all be done by the machines. So humans can focus on more creative side of the stuff. And obviously, like this has to be. Um, organized, like Alberta infrastructure projects are now requiring you to deliver BIM files. Um, COBE files will need to be delivered. You, you have to generate them. In UK, it's BIM level two is mandatory, and eventually it is going to be integrated into these, uh, these uh, digital twins of the cities. And it is not just a CAD file, as you look at it. It's a database of everything that the whole um, development process encapsulates. It's, it, it is um, common logic. It is common data structures that serve a purpose over there. So it needs to be integrated into something that we can all benefit from. It needs to be open to the private sector so that they can make better decisions. It, it can be monetized by the city, by the municipalities as well, by uh, providing this data. They can actually provide businesses with valuable information and, and charge people for that too. Uh, eventually, or hopefully, we're going to expect uh, like all the cities to be expecting a BIM deliverable during uh, a public project. Everyone will need to be able to process that through common 
interoperable structured data. And that's what's going to drive uh, the smart cities. And smart cities will not be able to do without their virtual replicas. The interesting thing here is for the construction, again, going back to one level above agriculture when it comes to technology adoption. We have the technology available. Like, we've got 5G coming, we've got industrial IoT, we're changing the factories. That's what Stambul Studios is doing as additional projects, not just visualizing the buildings, but also adding data and analytics components to it so that the facility managers and the decision makers in the city can all utilize a common framework through uh, non-projected screens or projected screens, a virtual reality and augmented reality, and enable them to use this data um, as part of an ambient computing framework. That's what um, we're working on. But construction needs to start digitizing every asset that they have today so that we can go to those smart cities or the digital twins of the cities in the best possible way. I know the technology is here. The process, we're working on standardization. UK is uh, a front, forefront leader with this. Some, some states in, in the United States are doing a phenomenal job with it. Alberta infrastructure, again, I, br I bring it up again because this is a good one for Canada. I hope every other province will follow the scheme. Um, so we can have virtual BC, virtual Canada eventually, and, and make decisions at uh, municipal, provincial, and, and federal levels too by utilizing a digital twin of an entire country. We need ambitious projects like that. But the people, they have not yet seen, but we need to see the, digitize, the benefits of digitizing a construction site from the eyes of real people like myself, uh, like yourselves. It just, it's only then we're going to be able to um, analyze, measure, and improve upon that. And that's the only way we're going to take from today's construction to tomorrow's smart cities. Thank you very much, everyone.